think my water just broke. I felt like things really intensified. She was right there and she was coming. It was, it was an amazing feeling. I'm gonna cry just thinking about it. I could feel her head. We heard her cry. We were squeezing hands and she was screaming. <laughs> I'm Bryn Hump Palmer, and you're listening to The Birth Hour. This podcast is designed as a safe place for women to come together to share their childbirth stories. Stick around and join us to hear informative and empowering birth journeys from women all over the world. I wanted to let everyone know that we are doing a Black Friday sale for our Patreon group. This is a really cool feature that Patreon is now offering where you can do annual memberships. And we've set it up for Black Friday to give you two months free when you sign up for an annual membership. You can get that information at patreon.com slash birth hour and just check annual when you sign up. When you become a Patreon member, you get special perks like access to all of our archived episodes, which is over 350, maybe close to 400 episodes right now that are not available to the general public. You also get membership in our private Facebook group, which is my favorite place on the internet. So much fun support there. We do Zoom calls and questions are just constantly being answered and so much support is being offered there. And if you sign up at the $10 a month level, which is our co-producer level, then you're getting access to our weekly partner podcast. This is a podcast that comes out every single Friday hosted by my husband, Richard, interviewing partners on their perspective of pregnancy, birth, and postpartum. Again, you can get all that information over at patreon.com slash birth hour, and we'll run this Black Friday sale through Monday. And it's, again, it's two months free with an annual membership at patreon.com slash birth hour. Today's episode is sponsored by Aeroflow Breast Pumps. Aeroflow Breast Pumps has helped thousands of new and expecting moms find the perfect pump for her lifestyle. They offer all major pump brands, including Medela, Spectra, Motif, Lansino, Amida, and more. And the best part is they take care of everything, including getting all the required paperwork, dealing with your insurance company, and explaining your options in order to get your free pump shipped straight to your door. Bonus, you may also qualify for free maternity compression garments like compression socks, maternity support band, and a postpartum recovery garment, plus breast pump resupply products ranging from new bottles, tubing, and flanges to duct valves and pump membranes. All you have to do is go to Aeroflow Breast Pump's website and fill out their free and easy qualified through insurance form. Be sure to go to aeroflowbreastpumps.com slash birth hour so they'll know I sent you. At the end of this episode, we'll be talking a little bit more about Aeroflow and how it's so easy to use their service. Today's birth story guest is Laurel. She's going to be sharing her experience being pregnant during COVID-19 in Japan, as well as dealing with postpartum preeclampsia. Hi, Laurel. Welcome to the birth hour. Thanks for coming on the podcast today. Hi, thanks for having me here. I'm really excited. Can you start by telling listeners a little bit about you and your family? Yeah, so I am a first time mom. My husband and I are currently living in Japan. He is an Air Force pilot and I am a former professional dancer. We met in Little Rock, Arkansas, and I never imagined that I would end up becoming a parent overseas. I was really excited to move here when we found out that we would be heading overseas and just expected that I would keep on dancing and teaching. But a couple years later, here we are with a beautiful five and a half month old baby girl. So it's been quite a ride for us becoming parents in the middle of a pandemic and (laughs) figuring out life at an overseas location, but we are really thankful to be where we are right now. All right. Well, I'm excited to hear how this all started. So let's talk about finding out you were pregnant and how your pregnancy went. I was really thankful to have an easy pregnancy early on. We were actually in Thailand at the time, and I feel like it's important to clarify that there's a very distinct pre-COVID part of my entire birth journey and then a post-COVID part. When travel was quite easy for us, we thought, oh, let's go to Thailand and have some adventures over there. So I was starting to feel a little bit tired on some of our hikes. I did not think I was pregnant. I just thought I was out of shape. But as we were sightseeing, I noticed that I really wanted to take naps more often and just felt a little bit more out of breath. So we came back from that trip and immediately decided, you know, what's a great idea after traveling internationally? 
let's hike Mount Fuji because that was one of the things that I wanted to accomplish before we had a baby. So we had actually hiked Mount Fuji a few weeks earlier in the summer, but it had been in the middle of a typhoon. Maybe not a great idea, but we struggled up the mountaintop. We're completely soaking and miserable by the end and came back down with really no mountain views to speak of, none of that picturesque looking over the clouds. It was just complete rain and downpour. So we got back from Thailand <laughs> and decided to head out on a hike again two days later. And again, as we were heading up, I thought, you know, it was a hard hike the first time, but it wasn't this hard. What happened to me in the meantime? I've been active and I'm still just feeling really run down. Maybe about two weeks later was when I decided to take a pregnancy test. And we had been casually trying to get pregnant, but not really timing or planning anything specifically. And to my great surprise, it was positive. And I just sat there thinking, oh my goodness, I'm going to be a mom and I'm living in Japan right now. What is my life? <laughs> I like to joke that there were actually three of us up on top of Mount Fuji that second time that we hiked. And thankfully, we did get our beautiful mountaintop views that time with the sunrise coming up over the edge of the horizon. So that was really special for me to be able to accomplish that goal before we had our daughter. Luckily, after that, everything went really smoothly. I went to the doctor and they confirmed that I was pregnant here at the clinic. The way it works with our healthcare over here is that we have one hospital on base. It is actually only about a two minute drive from our house, which is really nice for getting care just to know that it is so close by. The only downside is that it is just that one option for English speaking care. And so if there are any major complications or emergencies, things get a little bit more complicated. Then they will sometimes send people to other English-speaking hospitals at other bases if it's something that they can foresee happening in a pregnancy. For instance, uh, perhaps a VBAC, they might plan to have someone give birth at a different hospital. But if it's an emergency, then they will send you out to a Japanese hospital in the community. Or if you give birth before 36 weeks, they do not deliver here on base. So with that in mind, I was planning on delivering here at the hospital. And so I went in and saw the OBGYN clinic, met all the doctors there. They have several doctors, so you don't get to pick which one is going to deliver your baby. It's just whoever happens to be working at that point. But I really, really like everybody that I saw. They were all so encouraging, so pleasant, and I was excited to get care here. One of the things that I was most looking forward to about having our baby here on the base was just the wonderful community of people that surround us. It's a very tight-knit community. You get to know people really well because you are the only ones who speak English in the area, and so there's this wonderful neighborhood feel to everything. I was also a little bit apprehensive, in addition to being a first-time mom, about the fact that I had committed to choreographing a production of Mary Poppins. I was involved with the theater community on base because of my background in the ballet and dance world. I had been teaching some dance classes here and had been doing that throughout the spring and then this fall had been recruited to choreograph this musical which was a first for me around 10 or 11 weeks of pregnancy I was already starting to think this could get interesting because it is the fall now and when the production comes up in the spring I'm going to be in my third trimester I'm not quite sure how this is going to work out but we are going to make it work so I Traveled back to the States in my first trimester, and that was really when I had just a little bout of nausea. I was getting off the plane at Narita Airport and felt really sick to my stomach. I stayed in a capsule hotel that night, which is a, a fun little Japanese experience, but the entire time I was just thinking, this time change is brutal. I don't want to eat anything. I just want a bag of potato chips, and that's it. That was my 
one significant experience with any kind of morning sickness or discomfort really throughout the pregnancy. That was as bad as it got was just after coming home from a quick trip to the States, I did not feel well. But luckily yeah, those that long plane rides are not fun quickly. anytime during pregnancy. <laughs> yeah, especially when you have a half a day of time change to deal with. Definitely makes you feel a little queasy and dehydrated and everything. Yeah. The first trimester went really smoothly and most of the second trimester did as well. I started feeling her kick pretty much on schedule. We did find out that it was a girl. I was way too impatient to wait until the end to find out what the gender was. So we were really excited when they told us the news. I'd had a feeling all along that it would be a girl. Even probably as early as seven or eight weeks, something inside of me said, it's a girl, it's a girl. And so when the technician told us, I had this wonderful sense of just being very connected to my own body and having this bond with the baby that was growing inside of me and thinking, it's my own little daughter. I can't wait to meet her. And she was very active. I had told the Poppins production team about pregnancy. And then during our first couple of rehearsals was when she really started kicking away. So I'd be sitting in some of our vocal rehearsals and feel these little pokes down in my stomach. And even though nobody else knew what was going on, I thought, this is so cool. I get to share this whole experience with my daughter and have her along for the ride. Second trimester was when probably around maybe 22 weeks or so, the doctor just brought up casually that my blood pressure was a little bit high and it was something that they might want to monitor me for. I didn't think much of it, but I did bring up this to the Mary Poppins team and a couple of them said, oh, I knew someone with high blood pressure. I'm sure it's going to be okay. You're just fine. You're healthy. And I was feeling quite healthy and strong. In fact, as rehearsals progressed with choreographing, I was jumping around probably a little bit more than I should have for numbers like step in time and doing the full tap routines. I would go in and work on some of the set construction and just felt really good and energized, especially after some of the tiredness that had started out in pregnancy. I felt nice and strong and didn't think much of blood pressure. That started to change a little bit as I entered the third trimester. And also as we started hearing word about there was a new virus in the world, it was shutting down some countries and things got a little more uncertain at that point. I was about 28 weeks pregnant or so when we started talking as a production team about what COVID would mean for the musical. And also in my own pregnancy, thinking about what this would mean for care. It seemed that quite often I would log on to Facebook and see that our Air Force base had issued some new guidance about activities that we could or could not do, about things that were closing, different activities on base that were being shuttered. And so here we were at the edge of a musical production that involved 60-some cast members and a live orchestra and not knowing whether we would have our production. And I was thinking, will I be able to give birth on base? What kind of support system will I get to have? Will I have to wear a mask in labor? Because these things were all evolving very rapidly. The production, by some miracle, did take place right before many things in the world shut down. I was 31 weeks pregnant at the time and still up on stage singing the part of the bird woman who sings Feed the Birds. And I got goosebumps thinking that I get to share this song with my daughter. I still wonder if someday as she grows up, she'll have any kind of memories of the songs of Mary Poppins because she certainly heard them over and over and over in the <laughs> womb. And so I don't know if it's going to trigger any kind of response in her. But we all felt very lucky to be living on borrowed time at that point because they were starting to ban large group gatherings, both at 
at our base and also around the world as news of this virus spread. And the fact that we were able to have such a gigantic production take place was, I think, very special for everyone because no one knew what was coming up ahead. And sure enough, after the performances were over, was really when the world went into lockdown. And my days looked very different after that. I was quite a bit more pregnant by that point. And so my physical activity started to decrease as well, instead of hopping around in rehearsal every day, but I would take long walks every day and just think, I don't know what kind of world my child is going to be born into. Things are changing so quickly. And so when I was having my OB appointments was when they started requiring us to wear masks to appointments. When I learned that we would only be able to have one support person there. And when we had to start talking with relatives about the fact that they would need to postpone any airline tickets they had to come visit us. That was one of the things that I had been a little bit sad about giving birth over here. Yes, the community of friends and neighbors is incredible, but it was going to be difficult to time any kind of family and relative visits because our house has limited space to host people. And so it was going to be quite a juggling act to just figure out the grandparents who wanted to meet their first grandchild. So when COVID started sweeping the globe, we had to say, well, you can't visit yet, but I'm sure this will be able to happen soon. We'll just keep monitoring things and see where they go. So in addition to monitoring COVID, that was when they started monitoring my blood pressure much more carefully at the clinic. Otherwise, I felt very healthy in pregnancy. Like I said, I had been hopping around in rehearsal and taking long walks. I did not feel sick to my stomach. At that point, I felt like everything was progressing fairly normally, but I think the care team was a little bit concerned by how small my baby was still measuring. They had me go in for several extra growth ultrasounds, which was difficult with COVID since the situation at the clinic was changing quite frequently as far as what services were being offered. There were a lot of elective procedures that were being canceled at that point. And so sometimes I had difficulty on the phone figuring out, am I allowed to have this appointment? Is this considered elective? But my doctor said I needed to come in for an ultrasound. So it was just some extra communication there and figuring out what kind of care I could still get. But they advised me to get a home blood pressure cuff. So I started monitoring myself every day and I did notice the numbers creeping up and start doing some Googling on what is preeclampsia. I don't know anything about this. The only thing I've heard about the word preeclampsia is from Downton Abbey. And that was a terrifying episode to watch there. So I don't know what I need to be prepared for. My biggest hope was to be able to make it to 36 weeks of gestation because I did not want to have to deliver off base, especially now with the virus being declared a pandemic. I was very scared about the language barrier and also heading out in the middle of what was now a lockdown and not being able to understand what kind of care I was receiving. And so every day I would wake up and pray please let me make it to 36 weeks. Just please let me make it to 36 weeks because I was concerned that if my blood pressure really did reach a massive spike, then they might have to intervene somehow. So around 35 weeks or so, I did have a concerning spike on my home cuff and called into the office and they recommended that I come into the clinic and go up to the labor and delivery area. It's a small hospital, so it's really a like multi-service unit, not just L&D. But when I went up there, I was having the thought, am I going to meet my baby today? Is, is something going to happen? Do I need to call my husband and have him on call? Because also with his work schedule and being a pilot, sometimes his hours can be very unpredictable. So they hooked me up to a few monitors. They took my blood pressure, 
and agreed that the spike was concerning, but that I was not in, in any kind of danger yet. My baby was measuring small, but I was doing okay. And they said, unless you have really concerning physical signs of preeclampsia, you're still good to keep going. So at that point, I really wasn't having any of the upper right quadrant pain or flashing lights, but I was starting to notice that in addition to the pressure spikes, I would get headache in the same spot every day. And at first I just dismissed it. But then as pregnancy went on and I entered the final weeks, the headache became much more consistent until it was every day just pounding away. My care team recommended at that point that I go ahead and be scheduled for an induction. And I agreed to that pretty readily. I was not worried about induction. I did not have much of a set birth plan because I knew that my care options over here were fairly limited, and I also really trusted my team to make the best decision for me. I think that if I had been living in the States with many options and access to whatever doctor I wanted to choose, I'd probably be a little bit overwhelmed by it. I think there are many pros to having that kind of decision-making where you can pick many aspects of your labor. But for me, I thought, well, this is the way the story is playing out. This is where I live and the options I have. I am ready to go with whatever they think is medically best for me. So they scheduled me for induction at 38 weeks. And it was pretty exciting to watch that countdown and breathe a sigh of relief once I finally passed the 36-week mark and knew that I would most likely be able to deliver here on base with the doctors that I was comfortable with and to know when we were going to be able to meet our baby. That's really how the third trimester went. It was a whirlwind of musicals and singing and lockdowns and watching my blood pressure climb and thinking, well, this is going to be interesting. (laughs) Yeah, I'm sure that was just like a lot to process. Do you feel like emotionally you were doing well with all of that going on? I think for the most part I was because it was all happening so quickly that I didn't have a chance yeah. to process it. I think that the novelty of everything, of thinking that I'm about to meet my first child and I've never experienced pregnancy, so I don't know what to expect in the way of how I'll feel physically or what birth will be like, had me more excited, nervous. I was doing a lot of listening to the birth hour on my walks, I'll tell you that, <laughs> since I had so much time now with not being able to go out into downtown Tokyo and explore. I would walk amongst the sakura blossoms in April and be listening to the birth hour and trying to prepare myself for whatever was to come because I really had no idea what was next. I was quite sad about the things that coronavirus was preventing us from parent-wise. I didn't have a baby shower with a large group of people. Instead, I had a porch shower, which was special that my friends would drop off gifts and have a little socially distanced cake together. Uh But it, it was very strange at the same time. Yeah. Let's talk about how labor started for you. It turns out I had been having contractions even before I went into the hospital, which I did not realize at all. I thought that contractions would be a very distinct feeling and I kept waiting to feel them. But when we went into the hospital on the day of our induction, they scheduled me that evening and hooked me up to a few monitors and went, oh, you're having some contractions. And I said, really? I don't feel anything. I thought it would be this wave of feeling and then it would subside. And no, everything was feeling very normal as far as our baby just moving around and kicking. But They decided to use the Foley bulb for induction. And so at that time, my doctor asked if it was all right if she also did a membrane sweep because I was already a few centimeters dilated. I think it was about three centimeters. And again, I had no idea. I had not noticed any signs of labor. I had not noticed losing a mucus plug or any of those things that might key me into the fact that labor was starting. I was really surprised that my body was already starting to get ready for this baby. It was pretty incredible. The membrane sweep felt a little strange, and I was lying there as they put the Foley bulb in. The doctor was saying, wow, you really have good pain tolerance here. I'm having trouble getting it in, but are you sure you're okay? And I said, yeah, I'm 
mean, it feels a little bit strange. I, I kind of feel a tugging sensation, but it's not necessarily painful. So at this point in labor, I was thinking this is going to be a breeze. I don't think I'm going to need an epidural. I think this is going to be a lot easier than I thought. But I would like to clarify that was not the case later on. This was my naive self getting too excited too early. So they came in and asked me about some of my pain management preferences and how I was feeling about an epidural, where I would like to be pain-wise before they offered any kind of management options. And I said, oh, I think I'd like to be at about an eight on the pain scale before intervention. I think because I've done so well so far and also because I am a dancer and used to physical exertion. I'll be okay. So they left it at that and they asked a few questions about my medical history and then they left me and my husband alone in the room. I was really excited about the doctor who was going to be delivering my baby. She was someone who at that time, I believe, held the record for the year of delivering the most babies in the clinic. So I knew that I was in great hands with her and with everybody else on the care team. And she was going to come back and check on me probably closer to, I would guess, around 5 in the morning or so. This was 5 p.m. when they inserted the bulb. And I thought that it would probably take a while for my body to kick into gear. And so she would just return in the morning and then we'd really start the labor process. My husband wasn't also sure what he should do with himself in the meantime because it seemed like it was going to be a long night ahead at the hospital. He decided to stay with me for a little bit and then drive home, check on our dog, eat some dinner, and then probably come back and spend the night in the chair because he was still allowed to come and go in the clinic. He did have to be masked when he visited me, but he was my support person. And at that time, they were not doing COVID testing for pregnant women yet. So I did not have to get a COVID test when I went into labor and delivery. I was able to just head upstairs and have a temperature screening. I hung out in my room. I ate dinner. I did a crossword. And then I started noticing that things were getting a little bit more painful. I felt this aching going down my back. I would look at the monitor and see the contractions coming and going. And I still didn't really get a sense of them stopping. It felt like this continual pressure was just building and building that it was this dull ache that was starting my back and then traveling around my friend. And I started to feel a lot less enthusiastic at that point. I listened to some music and then decided that I really wasn't feeling well enough to continue entertaining myself. I just wanted to lie there and breathe for a little bit. Around 8.30 p.m. or so, so it was about three hours after they started the induction process, was when the contractions started picking up in pain and also when we had the first episode of my baby's heart rate dropping and that would become the excitement of the night. So when you have so much time to just lie there in a quiet hospital room, you notice the rhythm of the monitors and I was hooked up to some belly bands with the fetal monitors on them. And all of a sudden I noticed that the beeping had become a lot less regular and I but oh, maybe it just isn't picking up her heart rate well and she moved or something. But then two of the nurses rushed into the room and they're like, okay, we're going to get you on your hands and knees. Everything is going to be okay. We're going to get an oxygen mask for you. Can you try moving the monitor around? All right, just keep breathing. And is something wrong? What's happening? And they confirmed that the baby's heart rate had indeed dropped quite a bit, but then they got it back up again. And they said, well, it's probably just an anomaly. She seems to be fine now. All right, we're back and steady. But that shook me up a little bit because everything had been going fairly normally up to that point. And then to suddenly have this heart rate drop and all this flurry of excitement in the room, I all of a sudden really, really wanted my husband there because he was still at home putting the dog to bed and getting ready for what we thought was going to be a long day after this. So my husband then came back to the hospital and I told him what had happened while he was gone. Then the heart rate dropped again and the same procedure took place with everybody rushing into the room from the nurse's station and putting me on my hands and knees. They had me lie 
on one side. Then when they couldn't find a good heartbeat over there, they had me lie on the other side. And the contractions were starting to get quite a bit more painful at this point. And thankfully, I was able to get a little bit of pain medicine at that point. It was not an epidural yet. And I can't remember the name of it, but my goodness, whatever they put in my IV knocked me out. I was so woozy all of a sudden. It was like I was having a conversation with my husband in the chair and telling him what was happening with our baby's heart. And then all of a sudden, I was just struggling to keep my eyes open and even put a sentence together. Pretty sure I was slurring my words at that point. But I was also really thankful for the relief that the medicine gave me because just the aching was spreading all over my back. And I thought, I don't know if I can do another 12 to 24 hours of this, depending on how long labor lasts. The heart rate drops kept happening throughout the night. I think around midnight when it happened again, they decided to have the doctor come back to the hospital. And that's one thing where I am so, so thankful for us living in this small community because both my doctor and anesthesiologist actually live in my neighborhood, which is only a couple minutes from the hospital. So if they are needed to help out with the birth, they are literally right there and can just pop in their car, drive across the street and be on hand to help. So because of everything that was happening with monitoring our baby, they decided to have the doctor come in and just be on hand to check me because it seemed like things weren't necessarily going to go according to plan. When the doctor came in, she checked me and he said that I was probably about six centimeters dilated. So it seemed like the induction process was working pretty quickly and that my body really was starting to take over for labor, but I was just starting to feel pretty miserable and pretty worried. I was thinking, am I going to need to have a C-section? Am I going to make it through this pain? When should I start asking for an epidural? I really had no idea what to expect ahead. But at about two in the morning or so was when my doctor said, you know, I recommend that we start thinking about an epidural just in case there needs to be an emergency C-section. Your daughter's heart rate does keep coming back up after we adjust you and go through all these flipping and turning measures and giving you oxygen. So she's not in constant distress, but it is worrisome how it keeps happening. I pretty readily agreed to that. I was very ready to have some more pain management there. The anesthesiologist came in and she gave me the epidural and it did not work as quickly as I had expected to. I thought it would just be this wonderful relief spreading across and instead seemed to kind of trickle into my back. And then because of the gravity of it, which was something that I didn't realize, it did not fully reach my left side right away. So I was lying there in the bed just feeling like a bone saw was going through my left hip. It was like my entire right side went numb and it was glorious. But then my left side was just this shaking pain that was gripping my hip. Luckily, they managed to kind of tilt me and turn me and so that the epidural was able to spread out completely. And I eventually got numb all the way across and it was wonderful. But those first maybe 45 minutes or so afterwards, I was still just lying there whimpering and wondering, when is it going to start to feel magical? It does not feel magical. I'd say probably around that time as well was when they started to remove the Foley bulb because it felt like my body was progressing quite rapidly on its own in labor and they didn't want to put my daughter through any more distress. So I was not fully dilated. The bulb had not fallen out on its own but they didn't want to put me through any unnecessary stress. They just wanted to go ahead and see what my body was doing. So my doctor also asked if I was willing to have her break my water. And I said, yes, go ahead. It definitely splashed one of the nurses when that happened. And also at that time, they decided to put a scalp electrode on my daughter so they could monitor her heart rate a little bit better and not necessarily have the heart rate drops be due to any kind of external monitoring. They thought if we can monitor her internally, then we can tell a little bit better how she's doing. What we think was happening with her heart was that 
her umbilical cord was wrapped around her neck. So my doctor was actually able to reach in and kind of push her hand out of the way because she seemed to be positioned so that my baby's hand was up in between her neck and the cord and it was all wrapped together. So that might have been partly why we were having such significant drops. And I was just amazed that my doctor could tell how she was positioned and that she was actually feeling my baby before she came out into the world. Because for me, I could still feel my daughter moving inside. And so the thought that she was halfway between the inside world and the outside was a beautiful and strange thing at the same time. But I was still preparing myself for the possibility of a C-section because I had been a C-section baby when I was born. And I thought, well, this would be funny if history ended up repeating itself for my daughter. So I was just waiting throughout the night, not really sure how things would progress or what would need to happen. But I was getting a little bit scared because I didn't know what all these heart rate drops meant. Around six in the morning was when my doctor came back to check me. She had been there through the night. And I was expecting her to say, oh, you still have a couple more hours to go. And instead, she checked me and said, oh, you're having a baby now. And I thought, wait, what? I was induced around 5 p.m. and it's 6 a.m. and you're telling me that I'm having a baby already? I don't know what's going to happen now. So they started preparing the room. The nurse came in who was going to help coach me through the pushing stage. I was a little bit woozy from the lack of sleep, but I was just amazed also that I was not going to need a C-section and that I was about to meet my daughter. The pushing part felt quite strange for me, especially having to hold my breath. And I was feeling a little bit panicky at that point. So my husband was wonderful about holding an oxygen mask over my face in between pushes. But I was able to stay calm and not have a panic attack. Thank goodness. And just kept thinking, I don't know how quickly this is going to go. I don't know how slow this is going to go. But I am so glad that I have this team of people here to help coach me through because I literally have no idea what to expect. In between pushes, I would say, how am I doing? Like, am I doing anything? My doctor would say, no, no, you're doing great. And I was thinking, but am I actually doing anything? I can't even tell. They were still monitoring her heart rate at that point just to make sure that she could handle the stress of coming through the birth canal. But luckily, there were no problems as I was pushing. Her heart rate actually stayed very strong and constant. And at 6.46 in the morning, my daughter was born into the world. And I could not believe it as they put her on my chest. It was just this whole rush of, I can't believe we're done. I can't believe that she came so quickly. I thought this was going to last multiple days. But here she is, and she's covered in blood, and this is the baby who is kicking me inside this entire time. So as the chaos of the room was around us, the only thing that I could think of to do was to sing Feed the Birds to her, since that was the song that I had sung so many times throughout pregnancy as we were rehearsing for Mary Poppins. So it was just really special to have her lying there on my chest and to be singing to her and thinking, she's finally here. She is safe. She is healthy. And I'm a mom now. I love that. I'm sure you had like the whole room crying (laughs) when you started (laughs) singing. (laughs) Oh my gosh. Okay. So then how was recovery for you? Recovery seemed to start pretty smoothly. And then that's really where things took a pretty sharp turn on day three. I did not have any tearing. I'm really thankful to say. My doctor said that I had a couple of of skid marks, but no tears, no stitches. I was able to get up and walk around. I was able to spend skin to skin time with my daughter. And then after a couple hours, we moved into the recovery room. I was feeling a little bit nauseous after birth, just, you know, with the flood of hormones and the physical stress of everything. And then having to wake up so often to feed her, you just enter this very dreamlike new parent state, but it seemed like everything was progressing really well as far as recovery. 
my daughter was quite tiny. That was something that I had not expected. They had guessed by the ultrasounds that she would measure at least six pounds, maybe more, but she was actually just under six pounds. She was five pounds, 15 ounces. And so there were some concerns just about her being so small and she lost a little bit of weight initially. But by the third day of staying at the hospital, we were able to go back to our house. The reason that we had an extra night there was I was just feeling a little bit overwhelmed by breastfeeding, by being all alone, and by being sleep deprived. But it wasn't really any medical concern that they kept us extra for. They did just release us with the note of caution that if I felt strange to call them and come back in because I had had the signs of preeclampsia with the headaches and with the blood pressure. And I said, okay, I think we'll be good. So we packed her up into her car seat and she was this tiny screaming little ball of arms and legs and we drove home. At home, I was settling into introducing our daughter who we named Marguerite, introducing her to our pets. We have a dog and a cat and thinking now we get to be home as a family. But I still wasn't feeling very well in my stomach. I felt pretty nauseous and decided to take a nap with her in the bassinet and I was in our bed. So that was around 3 p.m. on our third day after her birth. And when I woke up about an hour later, I felt really, really sick to my stomach, even more so than before. I stood up and went to go use the bathroom and had this wave it hit me of feeling like I was falling down a tunnel. I don't even know how to properly describe how disembodied I felt at that moment, but it just seemed like all light receded from me and I felt like I was falling into a hole. I started shaking and felt like I was going to throw up immediately. I grabbed our towel from the bathroom and just wrapped it around myself because I could not stop shaking. And at that point, my husband was downstairs and my daughter was still asleep in the bassinet. So I picked up my cell phone because I felt like I couldn't even walk. And I called my husband who was in our same house. And I said, Dave, I really don't feel well. I think we have to go back to the hospital. Poor man. I mean, he's just been through watching his wife give birth and the sleeplessness of being a new parent. And now his wife is basically unable to walk. And he has to pack up our entire house. He's packing the breast pump. He's packing the baby clothes. He's packing the car seat and trying to get us all out the door. So we went into urgent care. And that was actually where I got my first COVID test because they were looking at the possibility of readmitting me to the hospital. And when they checked my blood pressure, it was really high. I was having uncontrollable muscle shakes. I still felt like I was going to throw up at any moment. So they decided to start the magnesium drip that's often used for preeclampsia. And I'd say that was probably almost more miserable than giving birth itself. It makes your entire body feel like it's on fire. And so every time I exhaled, I would feel like I was burning. And I was just lying there in urgent care, looking at my husband, sitting in a chair, my daughter asleep in her car seat, just this tiny little thing that I couldn't even take care of at that point and feeling so helpless because my body seemed to be shutting down on me. They decided to readmit me to the hospital after my COVID test came back negative. And then we ended up right back upstairs where we had been just a couple hours prior. I had to stay in the hospital for another two days. They kept monitoring my blood pressure. They finished the magnesium drip. I never had a preeclamptic seizure of any kind, but I did have such bad muscle shakes that I couldn't really walk to the bathroom by myself. I needed the nurse to come help me because my legs were trembling so badly. And added to that, I did have a severe panic attack at one point because I just started thinking, what if I die? What if I can't take care of my daughter? My mind went to all of the worst places and anxiety just consumed me. And so My poor husband is in the hospital room watching me just 
struggle to breathe because I'm panicking and then my muscles are shaking because of my blood pressure and the doctors are telling me, just breathe, just breathe. You're going to be okay. And I was wondering, will I ever be okay again? I feel like I have no control over anything that's happening to my body. And it's so desperately hard for me right now too, because I am having trouble even feeding my daughter. And my husband needs to be the guardian taking care of her right now because I don't trust myself to walk around carrying her without falling over. So that was really, really scary because I had no idea what to expect with postpartum preeclampsia. But thankfully, I was doing well enough after two days that they discharged me and had me continue monitoring my blood pressure at home. I did end up back in our urgent care one day later because my pressure spiked again and was there in my pajamas, unshowered, with my daughter on my chest, and my husband and I were singing lullabies to her in the urgent care room again, but that time they were able to avoid having me as an inpatient and instead were able to just prescribe some blood pressure medication that I then took for several weeks afterwards because I kept experiencing some spikes and getting headaches. But I'm so thankful to say that at about the six week postpartum mark, the headaches finally cleared up and I started feeling more like myself again. It was a really scary period for me as a new parent and someone who is quite anxious to begin with and also had no family over here to go through this and to not know what was going to happen as far as my physical ability to care for my daughter. But by the one month mark, and especially by the two month mark, I was feeling much more like myself again. And today, I'm so glad to have all of that behind me. My daughter has grown quite a bit from her tiny little self that barely fit into her car seat. She definitely fills it up <laughs> now and is just a smiling and silly little baby. But the one week postpartum mark, I never would have thought that we would be at this point. It just seems so far away. And yet we finally made it here. And I'm thankful to have had the wonderful care from the clinic here and just all the support of our community. Even in these COVID times, there were lots of people who came over and dropped off porch meals for us and who watched our dog whenever I had to go back to the hospital. In, in spite of some of the scares that we had, it was a really positive, wonderful experience in the end. That's great that you had that community built up there because I'm sure being so far from home was really hard. I'm just thinking about your family too, being probably so worried about you and getting updates from overseas is not easy, I'm sure. Yes, I think they were probably living by their phones, both for pictures yeah. of Marguerite and also just for updates on what was happening with my health. But yeah. we try to FaceTime them every couple of days now so they can see how Margo is growing and all of her <laughs> new changes and everything. That's good. All right. Well, do you have any resources that you want to add here? Yeah. So there are actually a couple of things that really helped me both in pregnancy and then Afterwards, in the postpartum period, obviously, I would recommend listening to the birth hour just to mm -hmm. know the wonderful variety of experiences that people had. Because, like I said, I did not know what to expect in my story at all, as far as if it would be a C section birth, if I would get an epidural or not. And so, it's really helpful to be able to hear what other women have been through. But I also found it really good to read the book. Expecting Better by Emily Oster. I felt like that was something that quieted a lot of my anxieties in pregnancy, just as far as reading data and studies on different things that pregnant women are told about care and about what their bodies are doing. It just put me in a little bit of a calmer place to see some of the research this author had done. I also, for the postpartum period, would highly recommend following Carrie Loker on Instagram. It's spelled with a K, Carrie underscore Loker. She has amazing resources for postpartum moms saved in her Instagram highlights. And I have learned so much about baby care and breastfeeding and pumping from reading those. Finally, I would also recommend 
for any new parents, especially during the pandemic, to really reach out to online communities and to find Facebook groups or other social media groups that fit your parenting philosophy. I've been able to join several groups that have really offered a lot of resources as far as answering questions that I have about baby care. And I know that sometimes on different online communities, it can be hard not to say feel mom guilt if people practice a different parenting philosophy than you do. So I would definitely recommend to look around and find groups that reflect how you would like to raise your child and also just what you're interested in, whether it's a group that's focused on breastfeeding or a group that's focused on sleep habits, because there are a lot of wonderful online communities that can help out with advice or just say, yes, we've been there too. And it doesn't have to be something that produces mom guilt or anxiety. It it can be a place you feel safe and comfortable. And I've found that that has been so helpful for me, especially living far from family to be able to reach out online and get the resources that I need. Yeah, that's really great advice. I think that online can be super helpful, but can also be not so helpful (laughs) for lack of a better way of putting that. So yeah, find your community is always my advice as well. All right. And then did you want to share where people can connect with you? Yeah. So I don't have many public facing social media accounts, but if you'd like to follow me, I am on Instagram with an account that has pictures of my dog with occasional human appearances. So that is (laughs) at Shelty underscore in underscore place underscore pup. And it follows our Shetland sheepdog as he trots around Japan currently and will also feature pictures of wherever the Air Force moves us next. I'm happy to say that our dog is in love with our daughter, and I think the two of them are going to be best friends as they grow up. Oh, that's so good. All right. Well, thank you so much for sharing today, Laurel. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me to share this story. It has been a wild ride, and I'm so thankful to have our beautiful daughter at the end of it. Okay, now I'm going to chat a little bit more about Aeroflow Breast Pumps, today's sponsor. Aeroflow has been a longtime sponsor of the birth hour, and I've never heard anything but amazing reviews of their service. So the way that it works is you just go to their website and you fill out a really easy form, and then they will contact your insurance as well as your care provider, you know, to get proof that you're pregnant and then to find out what your insurance covers as far as breast pumps. And then within sometimes hours, maybe a day, or two, you'll get information from Aeroflow, a link to click, and you'll see all of your options. All of the major brands of pumps out there are available, and you could sometimes upgrade if you want maybe a you know rechargeable one, or you want one with a really cute bag because you're going to be carrying it to work every day. All different options that are either free or an upgrade. It's totally up to you, which is really cool because a lot of insurance companies, if you contact them directly, they might have like a couple options. So Aeroflow has really just condensed everything into one spot and made it really easy, which is nice. I also feel like they just can cut to the chase with your insurance company because they know exactly what they're doing. It's kind of like, you know, dealing with your car insurance. If you have a lawyer, you're going to get things done a lot faster. So Aeroflow can act as your go-between and it's completely a free service to you, which is awesome. I also wanted to mention they have a couple extra things now that I didn't know about when I used Aeroflow to get my breast pump for free through insurance, and those are their compression garments. So they have compression socks, which a lot of people end up needing during pregnancy. I wore them on an airplane when I was flying to Hawaii, and it was a long flight during my pregnancy. And then they have maternity compression bands to help support your belly during pregnancy. And a lot of insurance companies cover these products as well, which is really cool. I would have had no idea. I don't think insurance companies are broadcasting this information, but if you get in touch with Aeroflow, they can figure out whether that's something that is available to you or not. There's also postpartum compression garments as well. And you can always buy these things through their site too, even if your insurance doesn't cover them. The other really neat feature of Aeroflow is the services they provide once your baby arrives in the form of sending you, like restocking your breast pump supplies, like the bottles and the valves and the tubing and all these things that actually need to be replaced pretty frequently if you're pumping every single day. 
they will send you a reminder and be like, hey, you qualify for free replacement parts and we're sending them out to you. I don't think I even had to say like, yes, please, or check a box. I think they just sent them to me, which is really amazing. And that's another free service that your insurance covers, but you may not know about if you didn't have somebody advocating on your behalf the way that Aeroflow Breast Pumps does. So if you're pregnant currently, you can go ahead and do the form whenever you want. Go to aeroflowbreastpumps.com slash birth hour. Remember, it's totally free and it's an easy form. You can do that whenever you want in your pregnancy. And then depending on your insurance company, they may want you to, you know, wait until a certain like 36 weeks, I think was mine until they'll ship the pump. But I was able to make all the decisions ahead of time. And then it just shipped when I reached that point in my pregnancy and Aeroflow kept track of all that for me, which is awesome. Other companies might allow it to ship a little bit sooner. You can also fill it out even if you've already had your baby. I believe when I talked to Aeroflow, they said for most insurance companies, it's within the first year. That might, you know, vary depending on your insurance. But again, that's something that they will figure out for you. So if you haven't used Aeroflow yet and you want to get your pump for free through insurance, let's take advantage of our insurance plans that we have. Go over to aeroflowbreastpumps.com slash birth hour and they will get you all set up. Thank you so much again to Laurel for sharing her birth story with us and to Aeroflow for sponsoring this episode. You can head over to aeroflowbreastpumps.com slash birth hour to get started getting your breast pump for free through insurance today. And if you want more information from today's episode, you can go to thebirthhour.com and search for Laurel's name in the search bar. And if you want to take advantage of our Black Friday sale for Patreon members, you can do that at patreon.com slash birth hour and get two months free with an annual membership. This is for current Patreon members as well as new members. Again, that's patreon.com slash birth hour. Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed today's show, head to thebirthhour.com and click become a member to pledge your support. And as a thank you, you'll get an invitation to join our private Facebook group and access to exclusive episodes. Your vote of confidence and support means the world to me.